Okay, so um, it's a great pleasure today for me to introduce Professor Michael Levin. Um, he's a distinguished professor at Tufts University, as well as the Vannevar Bush Professor, and he's also director of the Allen Discovery Center and uh, the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. Um, and I'm sure everyone here have heard about his work on xenobots, um, which I've been told um, there'll be some, some of that at the end of his talks. So Michael has requested that uh, we uh, refrain from asking um, deep questions until the end. So just clarification questions throughout the talk so that we can get to the really exciting parts. Okay, so um, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for having me and, and uh, giving me the opportunity to share some ideas with you. Um, all of the details, and if you would like to contact me, uh, which uh, would be would be great, um, you can you can find me at these two um, at these two websites. So um, what I want to talk about today is is our uh, sort of perspective on collective intelligence and in particular cellular behavior as a kind of collective intelligence. So I often start uh, by thinking about um, uh, Alan Turing who, of course, uh, needs no introduction, was very interested in intelligence, in, in um, cognition in various uh, embodiments, and in particular in problem-solving machines, this idea that uh, intelligence can be manifest through plasticity or reprogrammability, and so we all, we all know that. Um, some people may or may not know that he was also interested in morphogenesis, the generation of biological shape. And it's often one might wonder why would the same person who was interested in intelligence be interested in you know, the kinds of uh, questions that the, the biologists tend to tend to developmental biologists in particular tend to deal with. And I think I think he saw a very deep symmetry between these two fields, which is uh, I think uh, very um, very important and still not uh, really um, appreciated um, sufficiently. So this is this is what we work on. In particular, the idea of problem solving living machines and. Um, one thing that we have to uh, think about as we drill down in the biology and we look to see what we are all made of is this idea that that uh, this this traditional distinction between we you know we look at things like um, termite mounds and and bee uh, colonies and large flocks and we say okay that's perhaps a kind of collective intelligence but but we we are true sort of centralized intelligences and and of course the idea is that that actually all intelligence certainly in biology as, as well as collective intelligence because we are all made of parts and components and in fact um, Ricard Soleil calls this kind of thing uh, a liquid brain in the sense that the the components are not fixed with respect to their spatial relationships so th this is the sort of thing of which we are made this is a single cell this is called a lacrimaria of course this is a a, a free living organism um it's it, it's one cell it has no brain it has no nervous system uh it is extremely competent in its local uh sort of uh, environment with its local goals so so it's physiological it's anatomical it's um uh, behavioral goals it's very competent without the typical things that we associate with uh with intelligence and the, the the really critical uh, part is uh, to realize is that all of us make this amazing journey from what people call just physics to cognition. So so we were all at one point a quiescent oocyte. So a little a little pile of chemicals uh, doing something like this, where specific uh, molecules interact with other molecules. But but eventually through this process of embryonic development we become something like this or maybe even something like that. And so that the, the thing about this process is that it's extremely slow and gradual. Uh, there is no special point at which a, a magic lightning flash uh, sort of says, okay, now you're a cognitive. Before that, you were just physics and chemistry. Now you're a true cognitive individual. That, that doesn't happen. So we need to understand this, this, uh, this scale up. We need to understand what happens from uh, the time that we are this to the time that we are that. So... Now, the main points today that I would like to talk about is this idea of biology's multi-scale competency architecture, which is a set of nested problem solvers in different um, spaces. And uh, one kind of invariant to all of this is, is navigation. And I want to spend the most of my time on this example, although there are many other examples, uh, of anatomical control, and specifically this idea of navigating morphospace. space. And I will talk a lot about bioelectrical networks, as not only the the mediator of, of um, kind of the 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 glue that that uh, binds uh, neurons together into a coherent emergent uh, intelligence, but uh, but also of a much more ancient roles for that same mechanism. And this has this has many 
uh, applications, for example, on, on biomedicine. And, um, and at the end, I want to talk about a little bit about synthetic bioengineering. I want to show you some, uh, some, some novel creatures that have never existed before and talk a little bit about what this means for evolution and for, um, for, for many other fields. So single cells uh, come in all shapes and sizes. This, this is a single cell. So this is a diatom. It's, they're very tiny. So this is a single cell. This is also a single cell. This thing, which looks like a plant, it has a nice uh, cap and a, and a stalk and some roots here. Um, it's actually, actually an alga. The whole, uh, the whole thing could be up to 10 centimeters in size. It's also a single cell. So if you're interested in morphogenesis by differentiating cells into different types, we already start to see that, well, actually, there's structure well below that. This, this thing has one nucleus, the, 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 you know, and it manages to, to make this amazing shape without any differentiation. Cells are also competent in behavioral spaces. So what you're looking at here, this is a slime mold called Physarum polycephalum. It has many nuclei, but it's still just it's still one cell. The whole thing is one cell. And what you can do is you can do, you can do this. You can put some objects in its vicinity. These white things are glass disks. They have no chemical on them, no food, nothing. They're completely inert. And if you put three on one side and one on the other, this it will consistently uh, choose to travel towards the three. What it's actually doing, as we as we showed in this paper, is it's actually sensing strain angle in the medium. It is incredibly sensitive to it, and it's pulsing, which you can't see here, but it's pulsing as a kind of sonar to build a map of its surroundings and and migrate towards the heavier object. And what's what's kind of cool is that. At this point here, for the first four hours, it sort of grows uh, in all directions, and at this this is the point at which it's got enough information, and now, boom, now it knows where to go at that point. But right here, you still can't really, uh, you know, you don't really know, but at this point, bang, it, it starts to go. So, so there are all sorts of, so this is, this is a kind of the field of basal cognition and trying to understand how biology was solving various problems um, long before brains and neurons appeared. So I want to talk about three, three or four things today. Um, for the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, twist some knobs on traditional cognitive science and um, uh, and 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 talk about uh, some unconventional agents that we can we can start thinking about. So this this kind of picture, right? This is this is a, a the, the the classic um, painting of um, uh, Adam naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. This this kind of picture is really pretty pretty um, prevalent in in a lot of discussions in the sense that. People really think about uh, of finished adult organisms as uh, the subjects of their study. So intelligence, they say the human brain or the rat or something like this. And, and what I want to do is stretch this in a number of dimensions, uh, both both um, in terms of uh, time evolution and the fact that uh, everything um, comes from one cell at one point, and also uh, the fact that uh, drawing boundaries between different types of uh, creatures is actually very difficult because of the interoperability of life and the ability to make chimeras. So the first thing we can think about is this. This is a caterpillar. Um, this is a kind of soft-bodied robot that crawls around and it chews plants and it lives in a two-dimensional world. It has to turn into this. This is a completely different hard-bodied uh, kind of creature which uh, has to fly in a three-dimensional world. It doesn't care about um, leaves anymore, but it does want nectar. And so, so the behavioral and the, um, all, all, all of these repertoires are completely different. So during this time, what happens is the brain basically liquefies. Most of the connections are broken. Most of the neurons die. It gets reassembled and rebuilt into a brand new brain uh, suitable for driving this kind of creature. And uh, one of the most amazing things is, and, and there are many examples that you can read about here, is that if you train this animal to have particular memories, uh, those memories are recovered in the moth or butterfly that comes out. So despite the uh, complete uh, rewiring of the brain here, those memories remain. So as computer scientists, we can start thinking about, okay, what kind of medium could we have that is able to store information and then uh, uh, that, that survives radical remodeling of the, of the structure of the medium? But you can, you know, this, this metamorphosis is very interesting because this is not just evolutionary time scales. This is a single individual. So if you're into philosophy of mind and you wonder what's it like to be a caterpillar or a butterfly, here's kind of the next level question. What's it like to be a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, right? What is the, what is the experience of this process as your cognitive medium is being completely reshaped? What we, uh, biology goes even further. These are planaria. These are flatworms. You'll hear lots more about them later. Um, interesting thing about them, well, several interesting things. One is that you can cut them into pieces and every piece regenerates and becomes a completely normal worm. But um, what you could, and so they have a true brain, um, all the same neurotransmitters that you and I have, uh, centralized um, 
uh, nervous system. What you can do is you can train them to expect food on these little these little laser etched um, kind of a bumpy uh, surfaces. Uh, cut off their heads. The tail sits there doing nothing for about ten days, and then they regrow a brand new brain. And then you find out that the uh, animal actually remembers uh, where to find the food. So the memory survives complete decapitation. So the interesting thing about that is, okay, somehow it's stored in the rest of the tissue. Maybe neural, maybe not neural. We don't know. Fine. But also that information has to be imprinted onto the new brain uh, that is that is um, uh, constructed from scratch. So this idea of moving information around and, and what happens to um, uh, cognitive information as uh, uh, anatomical information is being processed is really interesting, right? That's the nexus at which we do most of our work. And so now, um, finally, I want to show you an example. This, this bears on some of the evolutionary um, topics where this is this is a tadpole of a frog so here are the nostrils here's the mouth here's the brain here's the gut here's the tail now you'll notice something very strange is that here with well, the eyes is where it should be here but they're missing instead there's one on the tail and we engineered it this way and i can talk later about how that's done but the interesting thing is that when you make a tadpole with an eye on its tail despite the fact that for millions of years everything was perfectly set up to expect visual input from two regions right here into the optic tectum these animals can see quite well so we can do um, we can do a test. We made a machine that tests their learning and visual assays. This eye, in fact, uh, makes an optic nerve. It it uh, synapses on the spinal cord, not on the brain, and that apparently is sufficient for uh, for the brain to recognize this. This so you, so you can imagine this 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 weird sort of information bus onto which this uh, this organ is putting some sort of um, data, and the brain says, "Oh yes, I know what that is. That's visual data, even though it's coming in from a completely bizarre location. No problem, um, right?" So that that kind of plasticity um, is going to be a major major theme today because. Uh, one of the things that I think is a is a is a constant uh, theme in biology is that it does not overtrain on priors, meaning that it it uh, it 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 plays the hands that, that it's dealt at any given moment. What it, what what evolution is making are are um, uh, is, is hardware that is very good at dealing with a novelty because it doesn't actually have exact expectations and we'll and we'll we'll get to some of that later so the interesting thing the, what, what i think makes all of that work which of course is very challenging you know we were still struggling to make technology like that what makes all of this work is this is this multi-scale competency architecture where not only is biology nested dolls um kind of at the structural level that's obvious everybody knows that but actually if, if not only functionally but but um, computationally every level is solving different problems in their own space and so um, I've been working on a on a, on a, on a framework which I, I don't have time to really get into the details but if anybody's interested I can I can give you a link uh, that is is uh, that is going to enable us to think about very diverse intelligence this is not not only the kinds of things that people typically think about but all sorts of weird creatures colonial swarms and bacterial mats and engineered new life forms and AIs and maybe you know alien life forms whatever and 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 it's based in part on on uh, this kind of approach where and this is uh, this is you know from an old paper in the '40s about about uh, setting up a scale of uh, uh, cognitive sophistication all the way from very simple to to quite uh, advanced, with the idea being that you know there's nothing here about nerves and, and and brains and whatnot. It's 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 a cybernetic approach that's very um, substrate independent, and I think that's really important as we start to come up with frameworks that are really enable us to, for example, recognize um, uh, you know recognize alien um, intelligences. So. What we think about is uh, competency in diverse spaces. Now, the thing that human beings are very good at is recognizing intelligence of medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds through three-dimensional space. All our sense organs are sort of pointed that way. We're good at recognizing that. So we know, you know, when crows and things are doing intelligent navigation of three-dimensional space. But actually, life is navigating all kinds of really interesting spaces. So there's the space of possible gene expressions, and there's the space of possible physiological states. And then there's this, which we'll spend the most time talking about, which is morphous space. This is the space of possible anatomical configurations. So I want to, what I want to do next is, uh, is, is talk about um, morphogenesis, the generation of body structure as the behavior of a collective intelligence of cells in this morphous space. So we want to, um, we want to think, um, think a little bit um, differently here. So let's, let's ask a fundamental question. Um, this is this is a cross section through a human uh, torso. Look at this amazing order. All of this, the tissues, the organs, you know, everything is is in exactly the right place, the right orientation, relative, you know, right size. 
where does this structure come from? You, you would think that it would take an incredible amount of information to specify all this. And, and by the way, what would that information even, even look like? What would the encoding and decoding be? Because we all start life like this as a collection of embryonic plastomeres. Now, people, so, so I ask, where is this information? And people intuitively nowadays will say, well, it's in the DNA, it's in the genome. But we can read genomes now, and we know what's in the genome. What's in the genome are uh, protein sequences, the, the specification of the micro level hardware that every cell gets to have. There's nothing in the genome directly about any of this. Um, and so there's really a, a very f uh, deep set of questions about. Uh, how, do the cell collect, how does the cellular collective know what to make? How does it know when to stop? Um, if a piece is missing, as regenerative medicine workers, we would like to know how to convince the cells to build it again. And as engineers, and we'll get to this in the last part of the talk, we might ask, well, what else is possible, given those exact same cells, what else can we get them to build right, with, the, with the same hardware? And so this is, this, this, um, uh, the reason that uh, this kind of question is important is this. Uh, in addition to all the basic stuff, you know, for, for the biology audiences, I, I always point out that pretty much every aspect of medicine, with the exception of infectious disease, everything else, birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of this would be completely solved if we knew how to tell collections of cells what to build. If we could specify what three-dimensional structure we wanted the cells to build, all of this would go away. And so we can think about the future where uh, this is kind of the end game for, for, for this whole field is what we really want is a kind of anatomical compiler. We want to sit down and draw the animal or plant that we want, not at the level of uh, gene pathways or anything like that. You want to be able to draw the final goal here. This, I, want, I want a three-headed uh, three um, flatworm like this and, and, and with this kind of nervous system. This is what I want. And if we knew what we were doing, this compiler would take that description and convert it to a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build exactly that. Now, we don't have anything remotely like this, despite all the incredible progress in genetics and biology. Why not? Well, here's, a, here's one simple, um, simple example. Uh, this, is a, this is a baby axolotl. So, so, so axolotls are kind of salamander. This is a baby axolotl. Uh, baby axolotls have legs. This is the tadpole of a frog. Frogs don't have legs. Now, one of the things you can make is you can make a chimeric embryo. We call it a frogolotl. We're making these in our in our lab. And so, um, I, I would I would pose uh, this uh, this challenge. Uh, we we have the genome for the axolotl. We have the genome for the frog. You have all the genetic information. Now, I ask a simple question: Will frogolotls have legs or not? And there are no models in the field that will help you uh, answer that question. None. Because even though we know a lot about the molecular pathways that are involved at the cellular level, we really don't understand very well how large-scale decisions are made. And in, and in particular, not, not only can't we tell what the chimera is going to do, to be honest, we can't even tell what the individual is going to do. If you didn't already know what an axolotl was, or you were able to compare that genome to other genomes, you would have no idea what the, what the um, shape or the... Or, or the other properties of the animal work by looking at the lit genome. So where we are is, is, is this in biology. We're very good at this kind of thing. We're, we're very good at manipulating cells and molecules and getting this kind of information. What we really want is something like this. We would like to be able to control large scale anatomy. And to me, it reminds me of where computer science was a long time ago, where really uh, one of the things you had to do was you always had to interact with at the hardware level. So, so you, would, you, would, you would rewire the thing to get it to do something different. And this is where modern molecular medicine is. All of the exciting uh, approaches are CRISPR, genome editing. It's basically, it's basically this. It's trying to manipulate the absolute lowest level. And I think we can do way better than that because, because um, evolution doesn't do this. Evolution exploits uh, these amazing higher level interfaces that we can now exploit as well. Uh, that, that give you access to to all kinds of co computation modularity and, and and all kinds of other interesting things. So um, one of the things that we're interested in is a degree of intelligence, and by intelligence I don't mean, of course, human level intelligence. I mean something along the lines of that um, cybernetic um, kind of uh, scale that uh, that Wiener gave us. And William James agreed. Uh, he said that intelligence is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. So this is again a very uh, substrate independent kind of a functional definition. And so what I want to talk about in terms of this anatomy is this idea of an anatomical morphous space. So it's, the, it's, the, it's, a, it's a virtual space of possible anatomical configurations 
this is a simple example. These are snail shells, and every kind of a shell can be generated by an equation with three parameters, so you can build a three-dimensional um, kind of a space, and every existing snail shell is somewhere in this space, and then there are lots of regions, and we can sort of argue about why those regions aren't populated by, by real organisms and so on. And so... So, so let's so let's think about what what how much, if any, uh, intelligence does a collection of cells have in navigating this morphous space? Well, um, here's the, the 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 very kind of simplest thing you can do is you can take an early embryo, you can cut it in half, and uh, what you don't get are two half bodies. What you actually get are two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. So, so you start to get this idea that that development is reliable but it isn't hardwired because if you introduce changes, it can still get to where it's going. So there are a variety of starting states. Maybe there are some local local, um, uh, local minima, but what it knows how to do is get around and get to a correct final state. This is, you know, being cut in half is not the normal uh, state of affairs for embryos, but uh, no problem. They can still get there even when half the cells are missing. Now, this is, this is a, a regeneration which works in a similar fashion. There's our axolotl. Axolotls regenerate their eyes, their limbs, their jaws. It's just absolutely amazing. And so what you can do is you can cut this, this limb anywhere along the length. It will build exactly what's missing, no more, no less, and then it stops. That's maybe the most amazing part of this process is this idea that it actually knows when to, when to stop. Uh, when does it stop? Well, it stops when a correct salamander arm has been produced. So this is some kind of, um, some kind of um, means ends uh, thing going on here where, where when the error is low enough, that's when it stops. And by the way, you know, humans, of course, are not like uh, axolotls, but we can, we can regenerate something. So the liver is highly regenerative. Uh, human children regenerate their fingertips um, below a certain age, and deer regenerate uh, huge amounts of bone and vasculature and innervation every year. So uh, you can think about some of these, some of these examples. Now, the other uh, kind of competency that, uh, that these cells have is, is, is really amazing, which is that, you know, I've shown you that as an embryo, you can't count on how many cells you have. Um, so you have to be able to produce embryogenesis even when um, half of your cells are missing. But it turns out you can't even count on how much DNA you have or how big your cells are. So one thing you can do, this is a kind of one of my favorite examples. This is a cross-section through a uh, a kidney tubule in a in a newt, and normally it's eight to ten cells, and they sort of work together to build this kind of uh, tube. And, and and here's a cross section through that. Uh, what you can do, you can do this trick where early on in development, you can you can prevent the cells from dividing for a bit. The DNA accumulates, every cell ends up with multiple copies of the genome, and then you let it go, and then the then then development proceeds. But the uh, the cells are are now much larger; they're huge, and so no problem, despite the fact that you have too many copies of every of all your instructions in every cell, uh, and the cells are huge, what will happen is a smaller number of those cells will work together to give you exactly the same structure, so they adjust to the cell size. But even better than that, if you make the cells truly gigantic by having eight times the uh, amount of DNA in the original egg, what will happen is one cell will bend around itself, leaving a hole in the middle, and give you the exact same tubule. Now, what's cool about this is that this is top-down causation. This, this, this is the idea that cells will choose different molecular mechanisms to get the same job done at the anatomical level. So in service of getting the same large-scale structure, here what the cells are harnessing are cell-to-cell -cell communication. Here what they're harnessing are, is cytoskeletal bending, completely different molecular mechanisms to get to the same step. So the idea is that uh, this, this, this hardware that evolution has given us is able to make up for drastic changes of, uh, of, of, of its component parts. And, and the final example, and so, so that, that last example was known since the 40s. It was uh, discovered a long time ago. This is, this is uh, recent here. This is our work. And uh, it's, it's just a simple example of um, uh, this kind of uh, navigating, uh, navigating morphous space. So, so here's your tadpole here. Now this one has normal eyes. This is a normal tadpole and it becomes a normal frog. But in order to do that, it has to rearrange its face. So the jaws have to move, the eyes have to move forward, the nostrils have to extend, like everything has to move. The traditional way of thinking about this was that, well, uh, somehow the genome encodes some hardwired cell behaviors so that every tissue moves the right direction in the right amount, and then you get your normal frog from the normal starting position. So we wanted to test this hypothesis, and we thought that actually, no, probably this, it's much more clever than that. So what we did was we created what we call Picasso tadpoles. So everything is in the wrong place. The eyes are in the side of the head. The mouth is on top. You know, everything is, everything is scrambled. And the amazing thing is that these scrambled tadpoles still become 
pretty normal frogs because all of these organs starting off at the incorrect position will move around until they get to where they're going. Uh, in fact, sometimes they go too far and they actually have to double back, but everything will move around until it lands in this correct orientation and then it stops. So what evolution actually gave us is some kind of an error minimization scheme that is, uh, that is able to make up for drastic defects. This has massive implications for evolution because it means that if you have mutations that move your mouth off kilter or move your eye to your tail or do some kind of crazy thing like this, it isn't necessarily uh, the end. And if, it, if they have other kinds of positive implications elsewhere in the body, now you get to explore those because these organs are fairly competent in getting where they need to go, connecting up in the however they need to connect up and giving you some kind of functionality. It tends to smooth the evolutionary landscape by a massive amount. So this whole kind of uh, homeostatic process suggests that this basic emergent story that uh, that um, molecular biology tells in the in the textbooks basically that you know the the, the standard view of things is th this is that it's a feed forward emergent process basically that that there are genes interacting with each other some of them make proteins that do things that are sticky or they diffuse or something so there's this physics and then there's this process of emergence right so 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 simple rules um, executed in parallel over massive amounts of um, tiny agents give you uh, an emergent outcome and this is true of course this is true all of this does happen but i think it's massively incomplete because because one of the problems with this feed forward kind of story is that uh in addition to evolutionary issues if you, as an engineer or, or bio, you know, worker in, in regenerative medicine, if you wanted to uh, make a change up here, and this was truly a feed-forward process, you would have no idea what to do back here because reversing this is impossible. This is a terrible inverse problem. And if you decided that you know I like this this um, I like this axolotl, but it's missing a leg, or it's uh, or instead I want it to be um, a threefold symmetry instead of bilateral symmetry. What genes would you change? We have absolutely no idea how to, how to reverse this. I don't think it's a solvable problem. And as a result, uh, the gains of things like genomic editing and CRISPR and so on, I think are going to hit a glass ceiling because for the vast majority of problems, we don't know what to do down here. So what we focus on in our group is these feedback loops. The idea that what's actually going on here is that there are systems that measure error. They, they measure deviation from a set point. And then they activate both at the genetic level and at the, at the level of physics, and this is what we'll talk about um, for the next uh, bit. Uh, they try to get you closer to your set point. Now, on the one hand, the, you know, biologists, of course, know all about uh, homeostasis and set points, pretty, pretty, pretty clear. But there's something, there, there are two weird things going on here. One is that the set point, unlike a typical biological set point, which might be metabolic level or pH or temperature or something like that, this is, a, this is a complex data structure. This is some kind of anatomical descriptor of what this thing is supposed to look like. How do you store that kind of set point? The other thing is that uh, it suggests that this whole system, in a certain sense, is goal-directed. Now, not magically so, but you know, in the cybernetic sense, right, like a, like a thermostat. But but still, but you know, biology doesn't does at, at this molecular biology and so on doesn't doesn't love um, discussing goals and, and 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 things like that. Even though that we, we now have a perfectly good um, you know engineering uh, science of it. What this kind of view does, though, is that it makes a very strong prediction. It predicts that. If we wanted to make changes up here, if this is all true and there is there is some kind of a set point being stored and it's not purely feed forward emergence, then what we should be able to do is find how that set point is being stored, learn to read it, learn to rewrite it, and then the cells would build something else without having to make any changes to the hardware down here. In other words, if it's true that there's some degree of reprogrammability, this idea that the, the collective compares to a pattern memory, uh, builds to that pattern, we could change the pattern and not have to actually rewire the machine. How general is this, right? What else can these cells do? So you can see this, this now tying back into the themes that I started off with, with um, Turing and such. Okay, so, so, so for the next um, part of the, uh, the talk, I, I, I want to uh, show you an example of how this works because we've been looking for this uh, and, and, and we, found, we think we found it and we've started to learn to read and write it. And, uh, and the medium of all of this, maybe not terribly surprising for any neuroscientist, is bioelectricity. So how does this work in the brain? Um, uh, real quick, uh, just the hardware looks like this. There's a collection of uh, cells in the network. They have ion channels, which enable voltage states to, uh, to exist and maybe propagate to their neighbors via these uh, electrical synapses known as gap junctions. So that's the hardware. And then the commitment of neuroscience is that 
all of the uh, electrophysiology that goes on, and so this is this 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 group made a, an amazing video of um, a zebrafish uh, brain activity in a live fish thinking about whatever it is that fish think about. Um, that that the idea is that is that all of the the memories, the goals, the uh, kind of uh, um, the cognitive content of that mind is embedded in this electrical activity. That if and and and, and thus there's the the idea of neural decoding. That if we understood the encoding, we should be able to read out the physiological activity and then uh, understand what the uh, what the animal was thinking about or you know what 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 its memories were and that that kind of thing. So it turns out that this same exact system works everywhere in your body. So uh, this is an extremely ancient set of uh, set of tools that the evolution uses. Every cell in your body has ion channels. Most cells in your body have the exact same electrical synapses. There are neurotransmitter effect, um, signaling uh, in, 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 in most tissues of the body. And so we can now think about a similar project. What about uh, neuroscience outside of neurons? What if we could decode the electrical conversations that other cells were having with each other and, um, and understand uh, what, how, how this, this kind of electrical glue was, was, was functioning uh, outside of the brain? And so this is... A, a, an early frog embryo using very similar technology. We developed voltage sensitive dye imaging. So, so the colors are voltages. They're of course very slowly changing compared to this, but you can, um, this is a time lapse over about um, uh, 12 hours. You can see all the electrical conversations that the cells have with each other and all the patterning that goes on. Now, what, now, now we know what, what brains think about. They think about um, behavior in, 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 in three-dimensional spaces and then maybe linguistic spaces. Um, what, do, what does the rest of the body think about using that same, um, pro that same process? Well, whereas in the brain, what you have here is uh, you have uh, an electrical network issuing commands to muscles to move the body through three-dimensional space. There's a very isomorphic kind of picture where actually long before that, what the system was doing was issuing uh, commands to individual cells to move the configuration of your body through morphous space. Right? So what, what we think evolution did was this, this was this was first, and then what it simply did was 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 to uh, was to pivot this whole thing to uh, motion spaces instead of anatomical spaces. So we started, we, we, we got our inspiration from, from neuroscience. We steal a lot of um, tools and concepts from, from the neuroscientists. And so um, here's, here are some, some of the tools we use. Um, first of all, uh, we can do the imaging to see what the electrical activity is. We do a lot of quantitative simulation to understand how the voltages uh, arise from the various ion channel activity. Here's what some of these uh, things look like. This is an early frog embryo. Um, putting its face together, and one of the things you can see, and so the 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 the, uh, the grayscale here is the bioelectric um, uh, voltage potentials across the the, uh, the 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 tissue, and this is one frame from that um, from that tissue. What you can, from that the video, what you can see is that long before the genes turn on to actually pattern the uh, the face, uh, and long before the face really appears, you can already read out uh, a pre-pattern, a bioelectrical. Uh, pre-pattern of what the future face is going to look like. Here's where the mouth is going to be. Here's where the eye is going to be. Here are the placodes. Um, I'm showing you this one because it's the most obvious. It's the most obvious one to understand. There's other patterns that need a lot of decoding, but this one's kind of kind of simple. You can see exactly what it's going to do, and this and this pattern is functional. If I change the electrical properties of this, if I if I sort of draw using either optogenetics or or other tools to draw on this. I can, I can uh, wipe out this eye, I can put it somewhere else, I can change the location of the mouth. All of this is actually determinative. This is the, this is the set point that guides future cell activity. There's also, so that's a natural uh, bioelectrical pattern. This is a pathological one. We'll talk about that momentarily, but, the, but this is the one, um, there's, a, there's a, an incipient tumor, which we injected a human oncogene, and before that tumor appears, you can already see the disruption where these cells are basically, that oncogene causes them to electrically isolate from their neighbors, and uh, basically at that point they're just amoebas treating the rest of the animal as the external environment. They just disconnect from, from everything. So, so we use the same tools that neuroscientists use to uh, control these electrical um, uh, states. We can target the ion channels uh, here, we can target the gap junction, so we can control the topology of the electrical network, we can control the um, in specific states, using optogenetics, using drugs, using ion channel mutations, no electric fields applications, no waves, no magnets, no electromagnetics. This is this is exactly um, what neuroscientists do by 
controlling the by, by use it by exploiting the actual interface right that, that the system gives us to manipulate the computations that it does so how do we know this is of any of any use what happens when you do this well here's one simple example what we can do is i showed you a bioelectrical pattern that uh tells the animal where to put its eye so well we can reproduce that pattern somewhere else by injecting ion channel genes specific um uh, let's say potassium channels somewhere else and so you can introduce that pattern onto the gut and that tells the gut cells Hey, you need to make an eye here. And if you section that eye, you get all the right, le you know, um, lens, right, and optic nerve, you get all that stuff. Now, a couple of interesting things. So one, one is that the modularity is amazing because what we actually introduce is a very low information content signal. Uh, we don't give all the information that you need to know how to make an eye, what are all the 30 different cell types that are inside the eye. We don't produce any of that. It's very modular. It's a subroutine call. We say, uh, build an eye here and everything else, all the molecular cascades that actually require to, to build an eye and make, you know, retinal cells and all that, all that's downstream. So that's, that's the first thing. It's, it's, it's highly modular. The second thing is that it has a really interesting uh, competency. One, one of them is that in, uh, the, in, in this case, this, what you're looking at, this is a, uh, a cross-section of a lens right here, sitting out in the tail somewhere of a tadpole. And the blue cells are the ones that we actually uh, injected with our ion channel. So we told these blue cells, you need to make an eye. But there's not enough of them to make an eye. So very much like ants in an ant colony, what they do is they know how to recruit their neighbors. What they did is recruit a bunch of these brown cells, which themselves were never touched by us. They're completely normal body cells. And they're able to say to these cells, uh, we need to make a lens here. There's not enough of us to make a lens. You're now going to participate. And that same thing is studied by people who work on uh, collective insects and so on this ability to uh to 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 gauge the uh, sort of uh, size of the of the project you're embarking on and, and recruit other members of the of the swarm to work with you so so these cells certainly have the ability to do that you can make um in using that same modulation we've discovered the code for things like inner ear organs so otocysts um hearts so uh, uh, inducing ectopic hearts in uh, extra forebrain extra limbs here are some six-legged um, frogs here that you can see and fins now this is interesting tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins that's more of a fish thing we'll get to that momentarily and so and so one thing that we can do with this now that we're starting to sort of uncover some of the native subroutines that are there is we can use this in a regenerative medicine setting so here's a frog uh, normally, if a frog loses a leg here, by 45 days later, there's nothing. Frogs don't regenerate their legs at this stage, uh, unlike salamanders. But what we can do now is we can give it the signal that says, hey, you need to rebuild this, this leg. And what happens here is uh, that uh, the way we do that is with a drug that opens specific ion channels at the wound. It turns on uh, the, the genes that you need to get started on regeneration. By 45 days, you've already got some toes. You've got a toenail, eventually a very nice leg, which is touch sensitive and motile so it's a very simple approach to again we're not reprogramming stem cells we're not 3d printing any tissues this is this is that point about the programming i made earlier on we do not want to interact with the system at the lowest level by telling molecular pathways or uh, or, or cells what to do we want to discover the large-scale subroutines and the large-scale control structure that allows us to say uh, build build a leg so we are in um uh, uh, at this point uh, trials in in uh, in rodents um, I have to do a disclosure here because this is uh, Dave Kaplan and I are, are co-founders of Morphoceuticals, which seeks to apply this kind of approach to regenerative medicine, hopefully someday for humans. So, so, uh, so you can see that that's kind of the applied um, side of the work. I want to switch to an amazing uh, uh, animal, which uh, really is, is going to help us understand some more um, aspects of this, which are that this is, these are, these are the planaria. You can cut them into as many pieces as you want. Uh, I think the record is like 275 or something like that. Um, they're immortal. Uh, they have no lifespan limit. Uh, they do not age. They're extremely resistant to cancer. And um, uh, they have uh, the world's uh, worst genome. We can talk about how that, uh, what, what that means uh, later on if we have time. Uh, but th but they're they have incredible capacity for, uh, for, uh, for morphogenetic control. One of the interesting things is that uh, remember that, that I promised you at the beginning that uh, we would, we would uh, be able to look for the pattern memory. We would, we would look for that encoding of the set point, that, that anatomical set point that tells the cells what do we build and when are we complete. So I want to show you a, sto a story where, where we can rewrite that pattern memory. And I've kind of shown you examples already. The thing with the face and the eye is kind of an example. But I think this is even better. So, so here's our planarian. It has one head and one tail. The anterior genes are up here, turned on at the head, turned off at the tail, fine. And if I amputate, 
head and tail, this middle fragment reliably 100% of the time gives us a nice uh, worm. Now, one of the things that we did was to discover a bioelectric circuit that actually told the cells with this, this fragment, well, how many heads are you supposed to have, right? Once the head and the tail are chopped off, which, which end is the head, or maybe both should be the head, how would you know? So, uh, so we discovered this electrical circuit, and what we were able to do is to convert this perfectly normal one-headed animal to a state that once we cut it, it makes a two-headed worm. This is not Photoshop. These are real, um, these are real, real live animals. Um, and here's how it works. It's because if you look in this, at this fragment, it has this bioelectrical pattern that says one head, one tail. And that's what the cells build. But what we can do is we can take using, using various ways to modulate ion channels, we can uh, convert this pattern to this pattern. Now it's a little messy, right? But you can see here, the technology is still very, uh, very much being worked out. But you can see what's happening here. There are two, now, now the codes is two heads. And sure enough, if I now cut this animal, there he is. Now here's a very important point that we need to understand. This electrical map is not a map of this two-headed creature. This electrical map is a map of this one-headed animal in which we have manipulated the electric circuit such that the voltage looks like this. It sits there being one-headed until it's injured. And at that point, the cells consult this map and build this two-headed worm. So the bioelectrical pattern is not a readout of the current anatomy. This is a, um, you can think about this as a primitive counterfactual memory. This is a memory of something that is not happening right now. In fact, may never happen. But if it does, if we get injured, this is what a correct worm is supposed to look like. And we will keep rebuilding until this is the pattern we get. So this is an encoded set point. A single-headed uh, planarian body can encode at least one of two different ideas of what a planarian is supposed to look like. Maybe more, no doubt more, we just said we, we found it too, you know, we found two. So, so this is very important. This is, this is the basics of, of counterfactual memory. This electric circuit can hold at least one of two different representations of what correct planarian lists should look like. And upon injury, the cells don't, this is their reference point. They have nothing else to, to, to gauge by. Now, why do I keep calling it a memory? Because like every good memory, it is not only rewritable, but it's long-term stable. So if I take these two-headed worms, and now I amputate uh, the head, and I amputate the, this other ectopic head, and I leave just the nice normal mid-fragment, no more treatments of any kind, plain water. The genetics haven't been changed. We, we never edited the genome. There's nothing wrong with the genetics of this animal. So you might think that, okay, well, once you've cut this off, now you'll go back to normal. Well, that, and that's not what happens. So, so these animals eat forever, in perpetuity now, generate two-headed worms. So, uh, where is the fat? Where is it stored that there are now two-headed worms? It is stored in the uh, electrical pattern distributed over the cells. That pattern has a memory property. Once you've changed it, it holds. And in fact, now we know how to change it back. So we can take that pattern, change it back to a one-headed, and then you get a line of one-headed animals. So, the answer to how uh, do how uh, what, what determines how many heads planaria have is not really nailed down by the genetics. What the genetics does is it gives you an electric circuit that by default says one head. But that circuit is, is, is reprogrammable. You can change it to say two heads and it will hold state uh, as, as far as we can tell for, forever. Um, and then you can sort of flip it back and forth. So you can think this kind of like, like a distributed, you know, sort of flip flop. And here are these, um, here are these uh, two headed uh, planaria in their kind of uh, native, uh, uh, native habitat. So, uh, so, so, so what we're doing now, so, so, so there's a lot of computational work that needs to happen. One thing is that we're trying to map out this, uh, the bioelectric state space of that circuit to understand why certain parts of it correspond to one head, two head, and so on, and view that kind of uh, regeneration as a kind of energy minimization process where basically what you're doing, and this will be familiar to, to all of you who study this kind of stuff, to, to um, recover these, these pattern memories when they are, when they are damaged, okay? And, um, uh, and, and, and so we really want to uh, see if uh, some of the mm, tools of connectionist uh, kinds of uh, uh, computer science can help us understand what's, what's going on here. The link between the physics of the circuit and the information processing of memory, of recall, of energy minimization, and so on. Now, um, I want to show you how far we can go with this. One of the, so, so here I've shown you one head, two head. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, but, but these are normal heads that belong to these animals anyway. Well, one thing you can do is you can push them into further attractors in that state space that belong to other species. So I can take this triangular shaped worm with no genetic change whatsoever, with completely normal hardware, I can cause 
just by uh, disrupting that electrical uh, decision making when they when when you cut off the head they have to decide what the head shape is i can make flat heads like the p felina we can make round heads like an s mediterranea or of course we can make the normal ones uh they the shape of the brain becomes just like these other species the distribution of, uh, of of stem cells in the brain becomes just like these other these other species they can access other a, a, a genetically normal set of cells can access other morphological attractors uh, if if you push them that way along the along this uh, bioelectrical interface, um, you can even push them further, and you can make you can reach uh, shapes that don't belong to planaria at all. So you can make these kind of hybrid forms. You can make radially symmetrical, you know, sort of um, ski cap looking things. You can make these weird spiky forms. There's there's a tremendous variety of anatomical forms that you can achieve if you interfere with the ability of these cells to navigate morphous space. What they want to do is to reach this region of the morphous space, and they're very good at it, but now that we found this electrical uh, process by which they navigate, we can push them into other areas. So, so what we're doing now is um, uh, we're, we're, we're building some, so, so we have a very uh, a biorealistic computational uh, simulator of uh, electrical activity, so we can, we can sort of um, look at the circuits at the at the tissue level. How do they rescale and, and and all of that? And then we're trying the goal, long term goal, is this um, kind of uh, full stack model where we start with the facts of which ion channels are expressed. So that's where the genetics plays out, and that's that's your hardware. But then at the tissue level, what are all the voltage dynamics? They're really not obvious because all of these channels, a lot of them are voltage gated. That's a voltage gated current conductance. That's a transistor. So when you put these things into circuits, you have all kinds of symmetry breaking uh, loops. <coughs> they have all, they can do memory as I just showed you. They have all, all kinds of interesting um, uh, computations, but, but high, very nonlinear, hard to predict. And so then we want to understand this, this decision-making of head versus tail versus, uh, you know, what else. And to the point where we get to an algorithmic model, so we're using some machine learning approaches to try and extract actually kind of white box algorithmic models so that then at this point we can say okay but what would we do need to do if we wanted a fatter worm or three heads or you know if somebody needed a new finger or a new eye or something like that okay so for the last bit I'm just gonna um, uh, finish up with a couple of things I want to talk about very very quickly uh, <clears throat> our this idea of because what I've shown you is the collection collective intelligence of individual cells solving a very large scale problem. They solve a problem that the individual cells don't have. So I want to talk about this idea of scaling. This is what this is what evolution does. Evolution takes this kind of uh, this kind of creature and uh, enables them to connect with each other to solve problems at the level of anatomical morphous space. So for example, if we don't have enough fingers, we can we will know that the tissue knows that and can regenerate um, the right number of fingers, then it stops. Individual cells have no idea what a finger is or how many fingers there are or anything like that, but the collective does. And so <clears throat> what evolution does is this amazing scaling up, but that process has a failure mode. That failure mode is known as cancer. So what happens in cancer is that when individual cells disconnect from this electrical network, they go back to being uh, single cell amoebas where where their goals are now uh, maximal proliferation and maximal metabolic gain instead of having goals in anatomical morphous space so this is human glioblastoma these are these are cells you know sort of crawling around in culture um, with with no no inclination to, uh, to to work hard towards these kinds of things so what happens is that <clears throat> the, the kind of kind of the magic here is in these electrical connections these these gap junctions that allow cells to share uh, information very tightly, and, and in particular, their synapses, they're called synapses because they are open and closed by prior experiences, meaning that the information that moves through a particular synapse also feeds back to be, because of their voltage sensitivity, to open and close that synapse. So you have this kind of activity-dependent memory, and so that allows a tissue to have much larger uh, sort of cognitive light cones in terms of, in terms of um, how much do they remember, how much can they anticipate, how much can they measure, uh, than, than individual cells. That's the scale up. And so another biomedical uh, sort of application that we're working on is to force that connection. So here, here is this, um, we inject an oncogene, so normally it would make a tumor. Here it is, the oncogene is blazingly expressed. In fact, it's all over the place here. But there is no tumor. Because what we've done is we've co-injected a very specific ion channel that forces that cell to remain in electrical connection with their neighbors. So when you force them, even if the genetics are screwed up, so I've shown you a number of examples where the genetics is diverting 
um, uh, from, from the actual outcome. What, what the hardware says is one thing, but you can make changes, and we have lots of other examples of fixing birth defects and other things in software by temporary electrical uh, states that push the system in a way that that uh, that they nor that it normally wouldn't wouldn't have done, and so this is a tumor normalization um, technology that we're also um, trying to um, <laughs> move to a medical outcome. So, so what we're trying the, the big mystery here, what we're trying to do now is to figure is to make computational models of local homeostatic loops that you that that started out in bacteria by by managing pH and metabolics and things like that. And, and show how by connecting these, so, so, the, so basically what you have is a network of homeostats. So you have a network of these things that are able to um, control local, um, local um, uh, variables towards uh, set points. And uh, by, by connecting them, uh, you are uh, enabling the, the collective to now do the same thing, but in a much, much different space. And so, so this, is, this is the kind of big area where, where we need to understand lots more. And so we're, this, these are the kind of um, models that we're thinking about. Okay, so for the last kind of couple of minutes, um, <clears throat> I want to talk about this idea of, of novel organisms. So uh, we wanted, oh, and I have to do another um, disclosure. This is, um, we, we also have a, a, a company, a spinoff company for, for biorobotics called Fauna Systems. And this is, this is all the work, work with uh, Josh Bongard at University of Vermont, with whom we've started this thing, the Institute for Computationally Designed Organisms. We wanted to ask a simple, a simple question. How, how far does this plasticity go? I've shown you that's, that, that normal embryos are able to adapt to changes of cell number, cell shape, amount of DNA, uh, but also you can push them to make, <coughs> um, you can make uh, uh, worms with the heads that belong to other species and, and, and body, worm bodies that are just not normal planaria worms at all. How far does that plasticity go? And in particular, if you take cells away from their normal context, can they reboot their multicellularity? What will they, you know, what will they do? And so we did, we did this experiment. I'm just going to pause this right here. So this is a frog embryo in cross-section. If you, if you take off this top part here, this is, these, all of these cells up here are going to be skin. They're, they're, they're all faded to be um, different kinds of epidermis. And so, so we asked this question. If, we, if I take these cells, I, I dissociate them. I, 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 I put a little drop of them in a separate environment away from all of this stuff. So I'm not, you know, we're not, we're not adding um, any kind of, um, uh, and, and by the way, the person who, who physically does this is uh, Doug Blackiston in our group. He's a staff scientist who um, <clears throat> perfected a lot of these protocols. We're not adding synthetic biology constructs. We're not changing the DNA. We're not putting in any weird nanomaterials. We're, we're engineering by subtraction. We're taking away the instructive signals from all of this stuff. And so what would they do? Well, they might die. They might spread out and sort of crawl away from each other. They might form a two-dimensional monolayer like cell culture. We don't know, but those are some things they might do. Instead, what they do is, so, so here these are loose cells. This is time-lapse. So overnight, they, they sort of come together and they merge into this little thing, this little round thing. The flashes are calcium flashes. We'll talk about that momentarily. Um, what does it do? So, so this, is a little, this is a little ball of skin. What does a little ball of skin do? Well, the first thing it does is it takes little hairs that are normally used on the skin to move the mucus down the body of the animal, and it uses those hairs to swim. It rows through the, through the media by, by, by um, pushing, pushing the little hairs in opposite directions to the left and right of a midline that it can uh, organize. Uh, <clears throat> here you can see some behavior. So they can go in circles. They can sort of patrol back and forth. They can... Um, here are some tracking data on group behavior. So this guy's going on kind of a long journey. Um, uh, you know, these are, these are interacting with each other. Then sometimes they sit still for long periods of time. They have autonomous motion. This is what they look like in a maze. So this is a water maze. There's no flow. There are no gradients. It's just still, still spring water. It goes down here. It takes the corner without having to bump into the outside wall. So it doesn't have to bump into anything. It just, it just follows the corner. And then around this, uh, at this point, Let's, let's, let's play it again. So remember, this is just skin. There are no brain. There's no brain. There's no nervous system. So it, so it, so it takes this corner. And then at this point, for some reason that we don't know, internal behaviors, it, it turns around and goes back where it came from. It doesn't want to keep going anymore. So it has, they have a range of behaviors. Um, if you ask, what does the calcium signaling look like? Again, no neurons here. But the skin is actually very, um, very active uh, with, with very brain-like dynamics, which we are now analyzing using information theory and things like that to see what's going on and whether they might be talking to each other. They have regenerative capacity. So if I cut it in half, they will try to fold up to their new Xenobot shape. Look at the amazing force through that 180 degree hinge 
that, that uh, they have to deploy to fold themselves up. And the most amazing thing that they do is this. This is, um, <clears throat> uh, we, we, uh, so, so, so Josh and uh, his student Sam Kriegman did uh, computational simulations of these guys in a virtual world with different different shapes that we were, you know, that Doug was able to actually make. And we saw something very interesting that, that in the computational uh, kind of uh, simulation, one of the things they do is they, uh, oops, is they um, rearrange the particles in their environment into uh, specific shapes. That was, that was a prediction of the simulation. So we tried. We gave them some particles. What did we give them? We gave them cells, loose cells. This is the white stuff, the snow here. That Those are loose cells. And what you see is that the xenobots run around. They corral these particles into, into little, 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 um, little, um, uh, little piles. And then they sort of uh, continue to, uh, to polish those little piles until they become uh, kind of these circular things. And then because what we did was we gave them skin cells, these little, these little piles became the next generation of xenobots. And so guess what? When they uh, matured, they went and did the same thing, and they, and they created the next generation of xenobots. So this is <clears throat> uh, von Neumann's dream. This is, a, this is a machine that runs around and, and makes copies of itself from particles that it, or the parts that it finds in its environment. The only reason this trick works, of course, is because like evolution and like us, it's working with an agential material. It's working with cells that are not passive, um, uh, you know, pebbles, but are actually materials that when you collect them into a little pile, they already have the competency of becoming a xenobot. So, so it actually takes very little to, to get this, um, uh, you know, to get this reproductive cycle happening. So the last couple of things I just want to say is this. Um, we can, learn, we can learn some interesting things from this. This is the standard Xenopus labus genome, the standard frog. If you only observe standard development, you are really lulled into a false uh, sense of security. You're, you're given the, the, the idea that, well, oh, the acorns always make oak trees, so frog eggs always make frogs. The genome determines morphology. This is what they can make. They make a, an, an embryo that has a certain set of developmental sequences and then a certain behaviors. That's what this hardware makes. Actually, uh, if you uh, if you if you liberate these skin cells, so what what do skin cells know how to do? Well, of course, they know how to be a boring two dimensional cover outer layer on this animal, keep out the bacteria. That's it. Well, that's what they do when the other cells sort of bully them into that role. The other in, the instructive interactions from the other cells are what's constraining the capacity of these skin cells to sit quietly as the outer layer, and uh, and and that's that. On their own, given given uh, the ability to escape these instructive interactions, they're actually capable of much more. They make a xenobot. They undergo a developmental sequence over the next two months. They become this thing. I don't know what the heck this is. It's, they have their own, uh, you know, kind of kind of uh, a weird uh, developmental um, uh, uh, trajectory. And their behaviors are things like making copies of themselves via kinematic self-replication. Now, this is interesting because for every other creature on Earth, if you were to ask why does it have a certain shape, a certain behavior? How does it uh, be able to do a, you know, whatever it is that it does? The answer is always the same. Well, years of selection, right? Eons of, of evolutionary pressure to do this or that. There's never been any xenobots. There's never been any evolutionary pressure to be a good xenobot, to do kinematic self-replication, to um, <clears throat> any of the behaviors that they do. There's, and, and the morphology, there's never been any pressure for that. So where does this come from, right? This, this plasticity, this amazing fact that uh, evolution gave us this genome that very reliably does this, but it also can do this, and who knows what else, right? I think we're just scratching the, the surface. So I'm going to end here and just and, and just say that um, the, the main points, I, I think, that are emerging from all our work, including many things I didn't show you, is this. Evolution tends to build um, generic problem-solving machines, which... Uh, because of this this kind of uh, compression of, of complex bodies into a single cell during during uh, sexual reproduction, uh, really enables uh, some amazing hardware that exploits aspects of physics and computation that doesn't try to pre-code everything. Um, and development shows us that that these kind of agents in morphous space and in other spaces uh, really have to uh, deal with whatever they're given at the beginning. They are not uh, in the in the large part. They are not. Um, uh, uh, tied to a very specific, very tight set of uh, initial initial conditions, and we can also talk about there's this uh, there's this comp intelligence ratchet that's formed because that competency actually hides a lot of uh, fitness uh, genomic fitness information from evolution. So, <clears throat> so a lot of the effort goes into that competency actually, as opposed to the hardware, um, and 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 the physiology, and especially the bioelectrics can navigate various problem spaces with all kinds of competencies, all kinds of interesting competencies. And then uh, synthetic bioengineering tells us that 
life because because of all because of all of this uh life is is extremely interoperable we can make any kind of um uh, uh, combination of hardware software. This is this is one of my um, one of my favorite kind of videos. This is this is a, a, a uh, an early uh, baby mammal discovering for the first time what kinds of effectors it has. Look at this. I've got I've got legs. I've got arms. Amazing. So one of the what, they they don't know. You see, you don't know ahead of time when 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 embryos are born into this into this world. Much like Josh Bongard's robots, uh, they don't know right away what they have, where their boundaries with the outside world is. All of that has to be computationally defined spontaneously. So if we're thinking about uh, uh, how intelligence has come into this world, here's what the biology is telling us, right? Multi-scale competencies, lots of uh, levels, as, uh, as Daniel was talking about at the very beginning, competing and cooperating with each other, spontaneous emergence of boundaries, um, energy constraints, which, which require you to do cor a coarse graining on, on your inputs, um, self-modeling, all of this kind of this stuff is what biology is telling us. And because of this interoperability, everything that we know for in the natural world, all of the Darwin's uh, endless forms, most beautiful, are just a tiny corner of this option space, right? Every combination of, of evolved material, designed machinery, and AI, and um, uh, uh, with software is some kind of agent, and a lot of this already exists. So, so hybrid cyborgs, uh, all all kinds of things. We are the future is going to look like this, and that really. It means that we have to redefine a lot of our old categories that started out by looking at this picture of the Garden of Eden, where you have a standard human, you have some standard animals, and that's it. And you can draw a simple line and you know what's going on. That, 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 that picture is, is, is gone. So I'm just going to um, close here. There are, some, there are some papers that if anybody's interested in um, diving further into these issues, um, here's some, some papers I could send you. I want to thank um, all the people that did the work. So Doug and Sam did all the, um, all the Zenobot work. Uh, here are the other um, uh, students and postdocs that contributed to this stuff, our collaborators, uh, our funders, uh, uh, most of all our model systems. The animals do most of the, of the heavy lifting here. Um, and that's it. I thank you for listening, and I will uh, take any questions. Oh, thank, thank you for a truly marvelous talk. Um, thank you. So, yes. And, yeah, so we have a few minutes for questions. I think you said um, we have about... 10, 10 minutes left. So, um, yep. Okay. Yes. Uh, Daniel, I think you were first. I, if I start asking, nobody else <laughs> will have time. So, so I le okay. leave others and, and uh, leave my mind for the last. Okay. Christoph, I thought I saw your hand. Um, oh, oh, sorry. I was just clapping. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, um, Anyone else before I start asking questions <laughs> as well? Um, <laughs> so, okay. Um, in that case, um, I have, yeah, you know, too many questions and I don't know enough about it. And um, I'd really like to know more about these uh, bioelectrical patterns and how you, I don't know, for instance, um, seem to have gained control over how to manipulate those say for you know you fix the genetics and you give it the somehow the phenotype of a different creature a different animal entirely yeah. um that is absolutely <clears throat> mind-blowing I, I have to say and how i mean it almost seems like you know you could make the phenotype of it almost seems like the genetics isn't as important as we th as we thought it. I mean, yeah, as we thought it would be. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just uh, yeah. yeah. To how to what extent can you get something with a sort of drastically how drastically different can the phenotype end up? I, I think I think that uh, well, look uh, in the in the planaria, it's 150 million years difference between the animals that we start with and the ones that we can make. And it, it's equivalent to 150 million years of evolutionary distance to these other species. Plus, of course, we can make spe we can make shapes that never exist that never existed. So you know, I don't know what the, what the distance there would be. But um, I, I think it's a very important point. I, I think absolutely the role of the genome is not what we thought it was. Uh, you know, what, one of the one of the key things here is though is that I think, and, and a lot of people get very suspicious about you know sort of computer science analogies, but I think I think the the part that is actually very very useful is the distinction between hardware and software. So I, I think that tells us what you know the genome. This this uh, there, there's the, we, you know sometimes students are taught this this that um 
well, uh, you know, the cell is the is the hardware that interprets the genome, and the genome is the software of the cell. I think that's that's completely wrong. I think what what the genome actually does is nail down the hardware of the cell. The genome tells you what channels you're going to have. If your genome does not give you a voltage gated ion channel, there's very limited. You don't have those transistors. There's very limited things you can do. So the hardware is critical because it 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 it, it facilitates or forbids certain kinds of behavior modes. But we all know now that knowing the hardware does not tell you all of the interesting things you need to know about what this thing is going to be able to do. Not only does it, is, is that can the same hardware run many different kinds of, of, of behavior modes, but also uh, it means that the way you interact with it does not have to be at the hardware level, right? That, that's kind of the, the, huge, the huge insight to, to me of, 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 of computer science is this idea of reprogrammability. There, there are certain, that once you get beyond a certain capacity, and I think biological systems are way beyond that, you can, you can interact with it via inputs, via stimuli, via communication, via, you know, who, who knows how high that goes, not just by rewiring it. And so I think that um, all of this, uh, you know, the focus on, on the DNA, both as the source of the information and as the optimal control knob, right? All the excitement over genomic editing and everything else, those things I think are, are misplaced. But that's not to say that the genome isn't important. I mean, you need to have the right hardware. If you don't have the right hardware, it's, you know, you're, not, you're not gonna be able to do certain things. So it's like there's a whole area of interaction with physics, what this hardware can do that, uh, you know, there is some physics that it exploits and that yes. doesn't yes. need to be in the genome. Yes. And yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it, yes. It's, it, that's, it's, yeah, it's um, yeah, that's, amazing. that's a very profound, that's a very profound um, idea, which is that, and, and, and people have been thinking about this actually in, in, in mathematics for the longest time. So, so where do the truths of number theory live, right? Where, where you know, you could change all the facts of, of the initial conditions of the universe and the number theory would still be what it is, right? And so, so think about this, right? If you were to try to evolve a triangle, so you evolve the first angle, you evolve the second angle, but guess what? You don't need to evolve the third angle. You know what it is. In, that you, you, where does yeah. that come okay. from? That, that, you know, that, that's an amazing um, mm. uh, kind of uh, fr free lunch, you know, as the physicists would say, right? And, and the same thing with computation. So once you evolve that ion channel, that's basically a transistor. So now you get to have logic gates and truth tables. Did you have mm -hmm. to evolve a truth table? No, you got that for free. Where do truth tables live? You know, I, I don't know, but that's kind of beyond my pay grade. But, 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 but I think you're absolutely right, is that what evolution does is it builds machines that couple to these amazing um affordances right so 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 in you know in in the behavioral ecology they would call these affordances uh, right. these incredible affordances provided by physics by computation by geometry by uh by mechanics uh, you know who knows what else is out there um yeah i think i think that's 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 really an important way to look at evolution oh that's yeah uh, daniel yes I, I can't hold myself anymore. Uh, I, I, first of all, uh, I, I, this is an amazing talk. I wish we could uh, now sit together and talk for the rest of the afternoon, which neither you nor I can do. But uh, uh, we should uh, definitely continue talking. Um, one thing that I I find we uh, I, first of all, I completely agree with this point uh, about the triangle. So um, I, I just recently said to somebody that mathematics is neither discovered nor constructed but it's a, it's something in between right and and basically you construct some things and then there are constraints that emerge and they are implicit to whatever you do um it, it's a bit like what i call a box of oranges you fill the box of oranges and you get these hexagonal patterns once you're dense enough and this is not something you created it, it's yep. a, aspect of the space uh, that forces this upon us but we still have choices between different crystal patterns for example in the mm -hmm. dimensions for example there are 14 crystal patterns mm -hmm. what, what I was wondering I mean it, to me it looks like there's an element of holography in the whole thing mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. where information is not fully localized and I, I, I felt that the most strongly actually in your example with the brain with double with the uh, yep. reconstructed brain um, because the question is how much information can you retain holographically? So when you take this plan on warm, um, and, and I think there was even the experiment that where even mice, I think mice got, yes. yes. The question is, well, how much information can you retain? Uh, well, in my language, I would say how many bits can you yes. retain in, in this delocalized form? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Uh, I, I have no idea how much information I uh, we, we we can't do the bits thing because we don't know what the encoding and decoding of the message is. So so that's hard. But 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 you're absolutely right. There's holography here in two ways. One is the sort of lateral way, which is that yeah, uh, most of this information is distributed spatially across the whole animal. So the bioelectric code and what enables us to to do these various things is not a single cell code. This is not something that tells individual cells what uh, cell type they should be. This is spread across the whole tissue. Uh, and, and of course, you can cut it both both spatially and behaviorally. It, re it, it rescales the information onto oh, every piece retains it. So that's, that's kind of lateral holography. There's also a vertical one, which is interesting. In, in a very important sense, a lot of the same rules that operate in, in uh, controlling the morphology of large-scale uh, bodies, you know, like ours, some of those same rules are playing out with um, uh, in the in the shaping of of single cells. So there are there are weird uh, you know kind of um, uh, mathematical um, aspects of, of morphology that work the same way in multicellular bodies, but also uh, in in indivi in single cells at a completely low at, at a much lower scale. And, and and other people have found the same thing in patterning of ant colonies and so on. So there's also this kind of um, uh, uh, kind of um, a f almost a fractal kind of idea, right? That, that the same things repeat themselves again and again at different scales, despite the fact that the material implementation is quite different at that point. That, that sounds really uh, very interesting because I do think that there might be ways of actually quantifying that. Mm -hmm. And I, I very much like this uh, attractor vision of, of genetic genetic coding because we know that embodiment can change a lot. I mean uh, the talk that I gave with you I think I had mentioned that very very primitive example of how you can totally change the amount of information you need to do something uh, if you change embodiment right um, so so it really drastically different than the big question is how much can you can you can you associate to the embodiment how much can you associate to in your case the genome? Uh, I see the Stavros had a question, so I, I, I just go silent. We can discuss another time. So I let Stavros go ahead. Sorry. Stavros? Yeah, I'll, I'll say thank you. I'll, I'll take the question, but I apologize. In about three minutes, I, 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 I do have to run. Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Daniel. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'll be very quick. I've, I've seen you in other talks sort of talk about using the language of affect. To kind of describe, like you know, navigating these morphological spaces and kind of extending the concept of uh, affect beyond what it, in, where it's usually used to, like these kind of describing these morpholo morphological spaces. Could you talk more on that? Yeah, um, I, I think I mean that, that's a, that's a very long discussion, but the, but the, the the short version of it is that we have been trying to map as many concepts in, in cognitive neuroscience as we can onto uh, this, uh, for example, um, navigating morphous space. So all kinds of issues that people normally uh, um, attribute to. So, so you know, uh, um, goal-seeking behavior, uh, rewards, punishments, um, uh, different, different, different types of learning and memory, different types of, so, so affect, all, all these kinds of things, perceptual bistability, um, visual illusions, all of these things can be mapped very, very nicely. And in fact, I have, I have a tables uh, in a couple of papers, which I'm happy to send, where it just goes side by side and it shows you exactly what the, what the mapping is. And so there are mappings for, um, for, for affect and for many, you know, for many, many of these terms. And I'm not saying all of them are going to map, but so, so far it's the, the symmetry has worked, uh, you know, kind of very nicely. So you can, you can define these things in other spaces. Well, it's incredible. Thank you. I'll, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Drop, drop me an email, and I'll send you. I'll send you the paper where we go into this. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, are there any more questions? I don't know if there's actually time for any more questions, but it's. I wish there were, but um, it's. Yeah. So, I yep. take this opportunity once more to thank the speaker for a wonderful talk. Okay. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the discussion, and uh, please, uh, by all means, uh, email me. I'd love to. I'd love to discuss uh, with anybody anytime. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. All right.